Good evening and welcome to Cafe Sci and Happy New Year. It's been a few months since we've had an event. Um, so I am Marty Ritchie from our corporate communications group here at SRI. And thanks again for being here if you're a first timer or a veteran. <laughs> um, we are uh, moving to a bi-monthly format in 2015, so our next event will be in March. On March 10th, uh, Dr. Marshall Bar Burke of Stanford will speak about the social and economic impact of climate change. I uh, hope you can join us then as well. A reminder that Cafe Talks are archived on our YouTube channel, and you can get the URL by picking up one of the bookmarks that we offer on your way out, um, or you can just Google SRI International YouTube and it should be up there toward the top of the results. So tonight's talk is a timely one, as news about Ebola and the flu have been all over the headlines lately, as we know. We're pleased that Dr. Brad Schneider of Metabiota has joined us to discuss how novel viruses enter into the human population from animals and can go on to become pandemics. He will discuss how his research group is studying this process in an attempt to control emerging viruses. So once again, thanks for attending, and without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Brad Schneider to the podium. Thanks. Well, thanks everyone for coming tonight. Uh, Tonight I want to talk to you about uh, international systems for monitoring viral chatter. And doing so requires a focus on the interface between human and animal health. And such a system, if successful, if successful would allow us to identify threats before they emerge. And usually at this point in my presentation, I have to spend a fair amount of time uh, explaining to uh, the audience and convincing the audience of the importance of zoonotic diseases. Uh, and for those of you who don't know it, zoonotic diseases are uh, diseases that are derived from animals and infect humans. Uh, but the viruses have been quite busy lately. Uh, and lately the media has been doing my work for me. Uh, and daily we're now um, thrown these images. And oftentimes the media doesn't do the best job and perhaps they're a little bit volatile in their message, but it does help to uh, bring attention to these important issues. And overall, the consequences of outbreaks have moved from uh, predictions and estimations to uh, real reality. So there are dramatic changes in our world, at both international and at local scales. And our interactions with new viruses and their connectivity with our world are changing dramatically. And this is influenced by a variety of different factors, as shown up here. Uh, land use change, global transport, migration and conflict, climate variability, markets and trade, resource extraction, as well as water and food security. The intense risk from microbial threats today is fueled by the interconnectivity of our world. This is a uh, short video that shows all of the inbound and outbound flights in the US over the course of a single day. And you can see the scale and number of flights. Uh, you can make out the entire uh, shape of the US. And you can even get a sense for the time of day based on the wave-like patterns of these flights across the US. And if you can imagine, these types, uh, the same level of flights are occurring internationally. Uh, so we've really grown to become far more interconnected than we used to be. So we can no longer rely upon geographical separation in order to protect us from the spread of infectious diseases. Uh, in our interconnected world, an uh, African hunter who's infected in his village can make his way to the capital city and be on an airplane in Paris in a number of hours. And soon thereafter, could be in LA or New York. You can see here a diagram that shows the buildup of air networks over the past century uh, internationally. Uh, you can see how just dramatic uh, how dramatically those have built up, especially in the areas of the developing world. It's important to note that this buildup of the transportation network isn't limited to just uh, air networks, but also on the ground at a more local level, roads are being built into areas that previously were pristine and untouched. And so the connectivity of villages uh, that used to require uh, days of hikes or even a, a motorcycle ride of a few days as well, now have a paved road that link them directly to the capital city. As an example, this is a what-if scenario that we put together for the spread of Hennepin virus from Indonesia. And I don't know if all of you know this, but Hennepin virus was the virus that was used as the model virus for the movie Contagion. 
And you can see here that in this model, uh, 127 countries are reachable uh, with flights of less than two legs. And in red are those countries that are reached first, and in uh, yellow are intermediate, and in green are the latest arrival. And it's important to note that in all of our models, regardless of the country of origin, the U.S. is one of the first ports of entry. And this is because the U.S. is uh, very well connected in the international network and acts as a sort of hub. And unfortunately, our current approach to outbreak detection and response uh, utilizes more of a <coughs> wait and respond type uh, approach. So because of that, there are big delays between the first case and detection and later identification of the virus or pathogen for that matter. And sadly, this is actually somewhat of an idealized graph. In most cases, uh, this isn't something we even can achieve. Maybe in the US with a virus that's well known, uh, we, could, we could achieve such a curve like this and have an opportunity for control. Uh, but were this to occur outside of the U.S. in areas that don't have the capacity for detection, or if it was a new virus, uh, this would be pushed farther to the right, or in some cases we may not even identify the virus at all. As a real-world example, this is the first nine months of the Ebola outbreak in West Africa that you've all been hearing about on the news. And you can see here that even though the virus, the first case emerged into humans probably at early December, it took us until the end of March in order to even identify that this outbreak was caused by Ebola virus. So it makes you think, had we been better prepared and better set up in these locations, uh, could we have restricted this outbreak to just one country or two? And would it have been as bad as it is today? So I think I've probably convinced you that we need to shift from a conventional reactive approach towards a proactive predictive approach. And to do this, we really need to push this entire graph farther to the left, uh, allowing us to detect and identify cases very early on after that first case occurs. And this opens up a, a much broader opportunity for control. The importance of this early detection can't be overstated. Uh, if nothing else, by detecting an outbreak early on and identifying it, we have a much greater uh, opportunity to control it. And Control equals fewer cases and hopefully uh, lower mortality associated with that outbreak. From the virus's perspective, uh, re a control of the outbreak early on uh, allows fewer human-to-human -human transmission events, which is very important because as a virus transmits from one human to the next, it learns more about our defenses and becomes better able at infecting us. So by catching an outbreak early on, we may have an effect on the transmissibility of, of that particular agent. From the scientist's point of view, by detecting an outbreak early on, we're able to better characterize the pathogen, and this allows for higher quality and faster diagnostics and also better therapeutics. So to do, to do what we're suggesting here, to push this graph farther to the left, uh, one of the first questions that we really need to ask is, where is the front line in the battle against infectious diseases? This is important because we need to know where to put our efforts and where to build up capacity in order to detect and respond to both new and emerging viruses. A lot of attention has been paid at major transportation hubs, like major airports um, or train stations or metro stations. Uh, here's a picture of the Singapore uh, Arrivals Lounge during the swine flu outbreak. But oftentimes the first cases of a new virus or even a known virus emerge in the smaller villages, in small clinics. Uh, although the capacity to both detect and identify a virus oftentimes don't exist in those locations, but instead in the regional laboratories and hospitals, uh, which are usually in the capitals of these countries. But it appears likely that the front line in the battle against infectious diseases is a little farther afield. Uh, these are photographs taken by a member of my team in Cameroon. It was outside of a small village uh, where they found this dead gorilla. And on the right-hand side of the screen, you see images of bushmeat, uh, both being prepared and sold. And it seems like this that oftentimes mark the beginning of an outbreak of a zoonotic disease, such as Ebola or even HIV, for that matter. So if we take a step back in time, 
uh, to talk about HIV. When most of us think about HIV, we think of the early 80s and the identification of this virus following the observation of a small cluster of unusual uh, diseases. Soon thereafter, many more cases were detected, and this became the worst pandemic of our time. But actually, HIV crossed over in humans long before this. It likely crossed over in the late 1800s or early 1900s when it jumped from chimpanzees into the humans who hunt them. It was present at the time that this photograph was taken in Congo in 1929, before the Great Depression. And likely by the 1950s, there were thousands of cases in villages just like this. So the question is, why did it take us until 1984 to detect this? And how different would our world be today had we detected in the 1940s, the 1950s, or even the 1960s? The vast majority of human infectious diseases are derived from wild animals. And viruses are constantly pinging us and testing our defenses. One can delineate five stages in the evolution of a virus from an exclusively animal virus to a highly adapted and specialized human pathogen. At stage one, viruses only infect animals. Uh, you don't see any human infections under natural conditions. By stage two, you have uh, primary infection in humans. So every single human case has to be initiated by contact with an animal, whether it be domesticated or a wild animal. Uh, and in this case, uh, you see initial crossover and no human-human transmission. Some good examples of this would be rabies, anthrax, tularemia, and even West Nile virus, if you consider the mosquito as a, as a vector for this infection. By stage three, you get limited secondary transmission. So although the outbreak is initiated by contact with wild animals, uh, you have limited human-to-human -human spread after that initial um, contact with wildlife. And this is a very important time for the virus as with each subsequent human-to-human -human transmission, the virus is learning how to better infect us and better transmit between individuals. But it's also a very dangerous time for humans as these maladapted viruses tend to play out in a very pathogenic way in the human system. Um, as you can see from some of the examples like Ebola, monkeypox, or SARS. By stage four, you get extended outbreaks, and influenza is a very good example of this. Even though the outbreak is initiated by an initial contact between humans and animals, in this case, generally swine, uh, after that, the outbreak can continue on with no other need for uh, an animal contact and become a pandemic, as occurs each year with influenza. By stage three, you have an exclusively human agent. This is a highly evolved virus able to continuously spread between humans and requires no wildlife reservoir to maintain itself in nature. At this point, these viruses are very difficult to control and they're very well adapted to humans. So although the vast majority of human infectious diseases are derived from animals, and a significant amount of time has to be taken for these animal viruses to adapt to humans, almost all public health attention is put at the top of this pyramid. Although viruses are as diverse as the host that they infect, and they're constantly exploring their space, geographic space, host space, genetic space, and some of them are crossing over. So this represents a very real front line in the battle against infectious disease. The question is, if we can listen in at this interface, can we learn something about the viruses crossing over and help to prevent outbreaks or pandemics? So let's take a look at some of these locations where these viruses are crossing over. This is a photograph of a hunter in Cameroon, and you can see that he's carrying his prey, which appears to be a baboon. And the very act of hunting and transporting the prey, as well as butchering the prey, leads to very intimate contact between hunter and prey. You can see here, if you look carefully, uh, that the blood from the baboon is traveling down the man's back, uh, down his leg, and onto his feet. So any scrapes or cuts that he may have acquired through walking through the rainforest, uh, oftentimes miles from his house, uh, could lead to a direct blood-blood contact between these two. 
And when this gentleman arrives home, he usually hands his prey off to his wife or his daughter, as the women are usually involved in the butchering of the animals. As you can imagine, butchering of the animals is an even higher risk activity. Uh, one, because you have a sharp object in your hand and uh, people are prone to cutting themselves. But secondly, you're actually opening this animal up and you're exposing all the bodily fluids and blood of this animal. You can see here as the woman is uh, cleaning off the kill, uh, this appears to be a small mammal, a small deer known as a duker. Uh, she literally gets hand deep in the bodily fluids of this animal. So any cuts uh, from this, this butchering or a previous one or any other activities would allow for direct contact between her and any pathogens that may have existed in this animal. And of course, hunting isn't limited just to one member of the family. Generally, all members of the family are involved in hunting. Uh, young boys oftentimes practice their skills on rodents and smaller mammals, as pictured here. It is thought that that's one reason why Young boys are at the highest risk of being infected with a virus called monkeypox. And the reservoir for that appears to be a small rodent or a squirrel. And I have some additional photographs here just to give you an idea of some of the diversity of species that are captured uh, for bushmeat, for food. And the young girl wanted to be part of the picture as well, although she didn't have anything to show. And here's a picture of bushmeat at the final stage of its preparation. So this is a fully cooked, uh, looks to be a small monkey, and it's ready to eat. At this point, uh, the risk is very minimal. Uh, a well-cooked uh, meat no longer harbors any active virus. Uh, but I also put this here because I, I think it's necessary to point out that bushmeat is a very necessary and important form of sustenance for the families um, all over the world. Uh, and in no way do we want to demonize the individuals engaged in this activity, um, but rather eventually shift their behavior so that they can uh, do it in a safe way uh, and perhaps uh, deal with less, um, less dangerous species as they do it. And of course, although all the pictures that I've shown you thus far are from Africa, this type of activity is occurring all over the world. Uh, these are images taken in a a wet or a live market, as they call them, in Central uh, Asia. Actually, I believe this is in Guangzhou, China. You can see in Asia, the activity is far less individual, and it's a little bit more industrialized. So in these larger markets, you get a mixing of species. And generally, the animals are brought to market alive so that they're fresher and they're butchered at the market. And you can see on some of these images, uh, on the top left in especially, uh, that you have levels of animals on top of each other. And there's no, there's no floor on the bottoms of those cages. So they're able to interact with each other in, in a not very sanitary way, um, which can cause a lot of interaction with the viruses that they have and lead to cross-species transmission events. Uh, it's at sites like these where SARS or H1, uh, H5N1 first transmitted over into humans. And, Having multiple species of wildlife along with the domestic animals can help to ease the jump of viruses from animals to man. And here I have a video uh, taken in a bushmeat market in Indonesia. And you can see here the variety of animal species present, both wildlife species and domestic animals. And they're butchered on site. Uh, I've been in some of these markets before and uh, as the meat is being chopped and you walk past oftentimes you can feel little bits of tissue, bone or maybe brain hitting your arm and head. Uh, so there's all sorts of opportunity for contact with the uh, blood and bodily fluids of animals. Uh, also when you look at the floor of these areas uh, you can see they're just covered with blood and guts um, so not the safest in, of environments. Uh, there was someone uh, chopping the meat. Uh, you get to see a variety of some of the wildlife species coming up here, I believe. In the center of the picture there are bats. They remove the wings and they smoke the outside of them to uh, make them last a little bit longer in the market. Uh, the wings are oftentimes sold separately. And here you see a variety of rodents for sale. Uh, I think they're actually smoked as well. 
uh, and finishing it off with a large snake uh, just so that we get the full range of, of species here. And I think this finishes the gun a nice close up of, I don't know if that's a bow constrictor or what. And the lady who's preparing the bow constrictor to eat. So this type of interaction uh, clearly leads to a lot of contact between humans and animals. Um, and this contact is especially risky at those areas where humans are pushing off into previously pristine areas. And in studies, we found that human growth in, um, right up against these pristine areas in the buffer zone is among the highest areas of population growth in the world right now.